Hello everybody and welcome to a car I've been wanting to feature for a very long time. This is a first generation X100 Jaguar XKR. The XK8 and XKR had something of an unusual gestation. You see, for a very long time, Jaguar had been looking to replace the aging XJS, their sports car which was introduced in the 1970s as the successor to the E-Type. However, Jaguar, like many British car companies, never really had that much money. They did what I think is called the XJ41, a styling prototype that never went anywhere. Then, a man called Tom Walkinshaw of TWR entered the fray and said, you know what, I reckon I can do something with the old XJS, because he'd been racing them with some considerable success and saw a future in the platform. He took one, mucked around with it, and essentially said, look, we can make you that XJ41 thing using the XJS platform. We can do something with it, we can keep this car going. But Jaguar, reeling from the financial disaster that was the XJ220, weren't really very interested. So, determined that this was a good idea, he went over to Aston Martin, then owned by Ford, like Jaguar, and said, look, we've got this great idea for a sports car you can make pretty cheaply that should be fairly decent. They said, yeah. And eventually, what turned out of that was the DB7. Jaguar, in the interim, were looking at Aston Martin going, you know what? That's a pretty good idea they've got over there. We should do something like that. So, they built the XK8. That is the reason that this and the DB7 look quite so alike, because they are essentially two different versions of the same concept. Now there are of course some key differences. The DB7 had a choice of either 6 or 12 cylinder engines, whereas the Jaguar was available exclusively with a V8. Remember those halcyon days when a manufacturer could introduce a model and the only choice was a V8? All you had to do was decide whether you wanted a supercharger on it or not. The early cars were a 4 litre, and the XKR made about 370 horsepower. This 2005 car is a 4.2 and makes about 400 horsepower with just over 400 pound foot of torque. It's about 530, 540 newton meters, something like that. In many ways, this car does feel like it's based on a pretty old platform. The giveaway is how cramped it is in here. I'm not especially tall at 5 foot 10, but my lockdown locks are touching the ceiling. I I've at many points in time looked at one of these cars and thought maybe I should buy one, but a few things have put me off. In no particular order, they are the fact it was available only with an automatic gearbox, these later cars getting a ZF 6-speed and earlier cars having two different 5-speeds depending on whether you had NA or supercharged. You also have all of this very plasticky 1990s Ford switchgear down here, which really did put me off. And like many Jaguars, they tended to have a sort of wood interior, which seven or eight years ago I certainly was not ready for. And even now, I'm still on the fence about. But this is a car that looks pretty darn good. These are a glorious looking thing, a very pure, sleek shape. Even this later car, which has a, a few little tweaks to make it more aggressive, is a really good looking car. And they're cheap. They are really, really cheap. I cannot say that enough. They were only about sort of four to five thousand pounds, maybe even less than that for a, a regular XK8 a number of years ago, and prices haven't really risen. In fact, you'd really struggle to spend more than about £15,000 on one, and this example, that costs less than ten, is proof you really don't need to. Now, this car's very kind owner, James, got extremely lucky with it. This car was sold to him via Tom Lenthal, who was a Jaguar specialist. It was formerly owned by an American helicopter pilot who always dreamed of owning an E-Type, but unfortunately couldn't afford one, so this was his next best thing. And in reality, this is probably a far better car. He spent a lot of money on this car, so over the years it's had an awful lot of care thrown its way. It has been resprayed, it has had all the rust treated, and that is an issue with these cars. Mechanically, it's been kept in very fine fettle. The only real modification has been to take away some of the extra reflectors and things that you had at the front end, 
and to fit a Miltec exhaust, which gives you just the right amount of V8 burble, the right amount for a Jag. This is not a noisy system, and cruising along here at 40 mile an hour, because we're still in an urban area, it's very pleasant indeed. The car is nicely damped. It does have the computer-aided whatever system, CATS, they call it. It's their adaptive damper system. However, you can't really do anything with it. There is a sport button down here, but as I have been corrected previously, that only affects what the gearbox does. If you want to change gears yourself, you have to use the J gate. And I'm not really a fan of this. I prefer paddles or an up-down sequential shifter or something. And the reason I don't like this is because it's, it's really rather light. I mean, it's just I mean, one for you. you blow on this and it will change gear for you. Lots of supercharger wine. That's the, the dominant sound here. The VA actually seems to play second fiddle to that blower. And it really still moves quite well, as it should for 400 horsepower. They're not a lightweight car, still being pretty much all steel, weighing in at about 1,800 kilos. Bizarrely, its successor, the X150 generation car, was all aluminium and weighed pretty much the same. That probably is down to the fact that it's a much larger car with many more systems and things in it. Now, some effort has been made to make this car a little bit more usable in the modern world. It's had a little Garmin nav system fitted down here and a reversing camera put in at the back, which is quite handy because the rear of this car does extend some way beyond the rear window. The back seats aren't especially useful, but you can actually get children in them, and that's what this car's owner does. He's got a three-year-old and a seven-year-old, and they fit in here no problem whatsoever. Adults need not apply. This car does really have a feeling of old school British luxury. In fact, the plastic switchgear is almost a real part of it because so many cars from this period, Aston Martin, Lotus, heck, even their Italian rivals, Ferrari and, and so on, they would have finest quality leather, although yeah, it probably is leather, and then nasty cheap switchgear. My Lotus XL, very much the same. The nicest Connolly leather you could buy and the nastiest switches you could find. The dials here are a pretty classic Jag, and the earlier cars, in fact, had three more dials down here, a clock and probably some pressure or temperature gauges, and that, I think, is the, the best look for this car, much better than the, the later ones. View out the front really is everything you would hope for from a classic Jag sports car. In truth, I call this a sports car, but that's really not what it is. This is a GT car. I saw one of the brochures for this car from 2005, and in it they rather boldly call it the new XK. As it happened, 2005 was pretty much the last year of production for this car. In 2006, you then got the new XK introduced. Note, the new XK base model was just called XK, not XK8. The XKR is still called the XKR. Right, 30 to 50, let's see what happens. Foot down. Changes up. Oh, yes. Nose points skyward, rear sits down, and she just goes. The car is currently sitting on 20 inch rims, split rims, and actually they're, they're, they're not ruining the ride to the extent that I feared they would. I actually drove one of these cars, an earlier version, many years ago, six or seven years. I was thinking about getting a, a new and exciting car to replace possibly my BMW that I had at the time. I thought I could do with something a little bit more powerful, more stately, more upmarket. And the Jag seemed to offer a lot of what I wanted, except it was stuck with the auto box. I saw that you could get one for only a few thousand pounds, and I thought, what's the cheapest XKR you could get? Well, it was six grand, and it happened to be only about five miles away from where I lived. So I went down and drove it. It was in a lovely red colour, Phoenix Red, I believe it's called. The car looked in really good condition, far better condition than anything should be as the cheapest of its kind. I took it out for a test drive, and it was a cold day, colder than this. It's about two or three degrees. And the bloke said, take it out, enjoy it, have fun with it. So I went out, and on a road like this, I put my foot down, and the traction control just said no, like it did just then. It, the car was not going to go anywhere. So I thought, okay, let's get a little bit further down the road. 
And I had a concern. My concern was this. At the time, my girlfriend would occasionally borrow my car to go to work and she would leave at sort of 5 or 6 a.m. in the morning. And on a cold, frosty morning with a very powerful rear-wheel drive car, you have to exercise some caution. I thought, what's the worst thing that she could possibly do? Well, the worst thing she could do was get to a junction and put her foot down far too much. So I found a junction that I knew well, which had very good visibility, about half a mile either way. And I put my foot down what I knew was too much. Well, the car spun up and it went round and round and kept going round until I was pointed completely the wrong way. Being used to manual cars at the time, I think what I'd done is when it started breaking away, I just lifted. But it essentially kept some power in. It was still had enough torque going to spin one wheel and keep me going through 270 degrees. My initial thought, this being a, a dirt cheap used car, was that it must have some absolutely awful tyres on. So I pulled over, checked, and no, they were nearly new, correct spec Pirelli P0s with plenty of tread on. And at that point, I thought, yep, XK, you're lovely, but you're not the car for me. Years later, though, I have mellowed somewhat. I always love driving Jaguars, and one day I will have one. There's something about them that I just love. I enjoy the fact that they are capable of great performance, but equally, I'm currently following a, a lorry now. There's a good overtaking opportunity here. I could probably get past him, but I'm not worried about doing that. It's not the sort of mood that this car puts me in. I'm very happy just to enjoy it, enjoy what it's good at. It is very comfortable. This is a superb Tourer. The boot is not the biggest, but it's big enough to have, I would say, at least a week away. You can, of course, then put more stuff in the back seats. There was allegedly a, a Jaguar boot option where you ditched the rear seats and you had even more storage in the back. I've never actually seen a car with that in it, but that would be quite a cool thing to have. I'd really love a car like that probably be unsellable because most people do actually use these back seats. I know people look at stuff like 911s and XKs and that and think the rear seats never get used. But trust me, a lot of people do. Or more importantly, they want to convince themselves or their partner that the seats will be useful even knowing they won't be. So it's a good negotiation point with a car like this. Over the years, these have actually proved to be somewhat reliable cars. The very early ones were dogged with an engine issue. Pretty big one too. Very common for the era. They had Nicacel liners in them. And as supermarkets had just started doing fuel and putting a lot of sulfur in it, the two things didn't agree with each other. BMW had exactly the same issue. Engines essentially got eaten away from inside and many of them had to be replaced under warranty. The later engines were better anyway, but the truth is that if the engine hasn't gone bang by now, it's probably unlikely to any time in the near future. Maintaining one of these isn't going to be the cheapest of things to do, but neither is it going to be anywhere near as expensive as its sister car, the DB7. Those do have a reputation for braking regularly and in a very pricey way. This, not so much. I'd still keep a sort of one to two thousand pounds ooh blimey fund going, but that really should be all you need. Pedal needs a lot of movement before it decides it wants to kick down, that's for sure. On the return journey, I'm going to turn around in a moment, I'm going to put sport mode on and see how that changes things. Gearbox, sport mode activated. Let's have some fun. So dynamically, how does the old XK do? Well, it's very clear that she isn't a sharp sports car. Even for her day, that's not what she was. A 996 generation 911 would run rings around this and would disappear on this kind of road. You're just that much more connected, that much more involved in the entire experience. This can still make very decent progress. The brakes you can feel aren't especially up to the task of bringing this 1.8 tons of car to a stop. They are protesting a little bit, but it's an enjoyable experience nonetheless. Steering never really comes alive, but it's actually surprisingly direct and keen when you are on it. The engine has plenty of torque low down and makes up for the fact that the gearbox, in whatever mode you're in, is a definite party pooper. Either it wants to give you absolute maximum revs, complete flat stick, 
or just nothing. Even in sport mode, it doesn't really seem that keener. Like my, my foot isn't more than halfway and it just does not want to change down. But then when it does change down, you've basically asked for everything and that's when things can go wrong. These seats also, whilst very comfortable and made from beautiful grade leather, don't hold you in at all. They do feel very much like a 1970s seat. I feel like I'm sat on a school chair, like a primary school chair. Like I feel way too big for this seat. And yes, I know I'm not a small person, but trust me, there are plenty of seats I can fit in quite happily. Uh, these, just the way that they're shaped, like the, the base of them is, is really, really narrow because there is a very big transmission tunnel, pretty wide sills, and this isn't a big interior at all. The suspension also has just a, a little bit of, of jitteriness about it. Now that may be down to a couple of things. The 20 inch rims, as mentioned previously, and I believe this car is currently sitting on some lowering springs. So I'd be tempted to go back down to 19s, which this would have been supplied with originally, and then just the standard suspension or, or do something a little bit different. To me, the suspension feels like something that should be on a much sportier car. This is very much a pure GT and it should be set up as such. Making the suspension even softer is gonna make you even less worried about the utterly useless gearbox. One thing I do want to point out is the Jaguar community are amazing. The Jaguar Enthusiast Club is one of the best owners clubs that I know of. The people in it are really friendly, and I know some of the people that run it too. In fact, a big shout out to Andy, who helped me get the XK, the Daimler, and also the Maserati, bizarrely enough, that I reviewed last year. When I did his XK convertible, I mentioned I wanted to drive one of these cars, and I've got to say a big thank you to all of the many people who got in touch and offered me their cars to drive. I had at least half a dozen very nice cars offered to me. I decided to start with this one because it was the easiest to organize, and also this was the car that I thought was the, the most appealing. It was the, the later XKR Coupe, and that's what I wanted to start off with. Some of the other cars were the XK8 or the convertible, and so in future I hope to be able to experience some of those, but really, today is not the day to be enjoying a convertible. I can actually see why the drop top would appeal to so many people because, again, dynamically, this is never the sharpest thing at all. So turning it into a convertible wouldn't bother me because it's not the kind of thing where I'm going to give it hell for leather in every single bend. It's just not that kind of car. So should you buy an old XK? Is one of these worth your money? Well, that depends very much on what you're looking for. If you want a sports car, I would say no. A Boxster, a cheap 996 if you can find one, a Nissan 350Z, all these sorts of things, they are much better sports cars. However, as a GT car, this is superb. As a thing to look at, I absolutely adore the XK. And this has now passed through those sort of awkward teenage years. This, to me, is a real classic. Yes, this particular one may be 2005, but as far as I'm concerned, this is a 1990s car, which means I can now start to forgive some of its failings, like the terrible switchgear down here, the fact it has the Ford key that blighted so many of things, and these same Ford indicator stalks, these cheap, nasty switches, all that sort of stuff. I can totally forgive that, because it all then forms part of the experience. And if you're looking at perhaps your first classic car, I'd say this is as safe a way as you'll ever find to dip your toe into those very exciting waters because it's new enough that you shouldn't have too many issues those that you do should be able to be sorted fairly easily parts you can still get because they share so many things with regular Fords and so on and so forth and that means you should be able to enjoy and use your car for many years as its previous owner has having taken it on many a European road trip in fact it still has the stickers showing all the places it's been so the first generation Jaguar XKR was not a perfect car, far from it. It is still underneath a 30 year old platform, doled up to try and just keep the company going for a little bit longer. But you know what? It did a damn fine job of it. If you're ready for what this car is, buy one now before the prices do go up because it's gotta happen at some point. Thanks all for watching. A big thank you to James for bringing me his lovely Jag. Please like, comment below, and I'll see you on the next one. Bye-bye.